Hello, everyone. We're just going to allow a couple of minutes to let the people that are signing in join us. But the event will be shortly starting in around like two or three minutes. Okay, so it looks like we're not getting any new participants right now. So hello everybody. Welcome, welcome everyone to the Student Leading for Climate Action and Justice Symposium for the 2022 Sustainable Development Goals Action and Awareness Week with the University Global Coalition. Before we begin, we should take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we are gathered. For thousands of years, this land in Northern California from where from we, where we are speaking has been home to the Padwin people. Today, there are three federally recognized Padwin tribes, Catchill D, Band of Winton Indians of the Colusa Indian community, Kletzel D, Winton Nation, and Yoka D, Winton Nation. The Padwin people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It has been cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. Hello. My name is Santiago, and I'm happy to be joined by my fellow interns, Nadia and Jerry. Hello. Hey guys. On behalf of the Office of Global Affairs at the University of California, Davis, we would like to thank you all for coming to this event in which we will be discussing environmental and climate justice and how students at UC Davis are working to address this pressing issue. But first, I'd just like to quickly give you some background on UC Davis and the UN Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs as we call for short. The SDG agenda is an ambitious set of goals, targets, and indicators adopted by all United Nations member states, including the United States, in 2015. The goal is to tackle the world's most pressing problems and to achieve a better and more sustainable future for us all. This includes addressing issues such as poverty, inequality, climate change, environmental degradation, peace and justice, and many other environmental and social issues. The agenda is wide ranging with 17 goals and 169 individual targets. Now my colleague Nadia will give us a quick background on UC Davis and why it's engaging with the SDG agenda. Thanks Santiago. UC Davis is a land grant public research university that is part of the University of California system. It has almost 40,000 students, four colleges, and six graduate and professional pr programs. Its range of expertise spans human health, animal health, agriculture, and the environment. Interdisciplinary approaches are interwoven across the university, which aligns closely with the integrated and indivisible nature of the SDGs. The SDG agenda also aligns with the UC Davis strategic priorities, as well as the university's land grant mission to advance the public good. For us, the SDGs provide a framework to bridge local, state, and global challenges. We see strategic value in international collaboration, and the SDGs speak to stakeholders that we work with around the world. To further these collaborations around the SDGs, UC Davis has recently published a report on how we are engaging with the 17 SDGs, called a Voluntary University Review. All these factors I mentioned form the basis of our commitment to the 2030 Agenda. And that is why UC Davis has joined the University Global Coalition and other SDG related networks to participate and work in partnership with other universities and organizations to support advancement of the SDGs through our education, research and service missions. We are participating in the UGC's 2022 SDG Action and Awareness Week to promote awareness of the SDGs among students and inspire them to get involved and take action. So first, who are we? We are a group of interns who work together towards the implementation and advancement of UN Sustainable Development Goals at UC Davis. And today we will be speaking with students at UC Davis to learn about how they are helping to advance environmental and climate justice on campus and beyond. We would like to extend our gratitude towards our panelists from Planeteando, UN, UN Millennium Fellowship and Engineers Without Borders for talking with us today. So without further ado, we would like to introduce Bernie Bastian, 
a PhD candidate in geography working on modeling and understanding how societies will be affected by climate change. He is joined by Raisa Pilatowski, an environmental communicator who has worked with National Geographic, Playground Magazine, and the National Autonomous University of Mexico to create digital content about the climate crisis. Together, they co-founded Planeteando, a platform for climate change and communication through video making, podcasting, and festivals. So hello, Bernie and Raisa. Thank you for coming. Could hey, you guys... how are you? Yeah, thanks for the invitation. Uh, we're really excited to, to be here, and thanks for all the, all the attendees. Uh, we're, we're so excited to, to be talking about this. No, th thank you very much. So, well, first of all, could you guys give us a little background about your, yourself and how you became involved on environmental issues? Yes, for sure. Well, uh, <laughs> first, sorry. Uh, we, we both studied our bachelors uh, back in Mexico. And we, from the beginning, we were interested in everything earth related. So we studied bachelor, our bachelors in earth science. Uh, I focused on environmental science and Bernie in atmospheric science. Yeah, so um, so yeah, our background was like uh, on, on, on the science of uh, climate change and environmental uh, and environment. But then we did a, a master's on more on the, on the geography side of things, more in the human geography side of things and planning policy and uh, also like a, a, a political ecology, political economy. So now, uh, and, and in 2017, we founded uh, this uh, Spanish language um, a project no? uh, about climate change. Uh, we started doing video blogs, like YouTube blogs about like a, a, like a very easy concepts to understand climate change. And then we started like, a, also like a, we started a really from, from the science basics. No? And then we started like talking more about like a, our like responsibilities as individuals and as a collective and our political responsibilities as well. So this blog started like um, starting to be like, well, it started to grow a lot and we started to be more like a collective uh, and more like a compass or like a space uh, in which individuals can come and like interact and create and, uh, and share their own like uh, also um, ideas or concerns about the environment. And, so that's basically who we are and what Planeteando is, and that's that's why we are here. Thank you. That's amazing. I'm actually from Mexico myself, so go Planeteando. Yeah. But um, I really like the concept of of how you guys involve the the community and just it seemed like you guys are trying to um, create create it at a very approachable project for everyone. So like building upon that, could you guys give us um, just a, a brief a brief background on what the term environmental justice means and why is it important for us to know about that term? Yeah, sure. So I think um, it's important to also learn where does it come from because it also uh, uh, highlights why it is right. So uh, back in, uh, in the 1950s, 1960s here in the US, uh, a lot of black indigenous and other marginalized communities, um, they started to realize that a lot of their issues with poverty, with health, with safety, uh, were also related to issues with uh, the way the environment was uh, degraded, degraded <laughs> in their workplace or in where they live. So they started to make these connections, right? That it wasn't just like a coincidence, but all those processes were connected and they started to organize and they started to uh, demand uh, better living and working conditions because they saw that they were interrelated. And the important thing was that they were the ones that they were being impacted while other people was being benefiting, what other people were being benefited by those processes that were degrading their the environment and um, their lives, right? So they they mobilized, they organized, they protested. Not not all the time under the umbrella or the term environmental justice, but that was the the seed the seed that was planted. And later, more activists and more people in other places, like in academia, 
identify these movements and they were like, okay, there's, there's this uh, common thread here, which is impacts to the environment and to people are related and they can be approached in, in, for example, in three different ways. One is, uh, I don't know if you want to tell, tell about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, one of it is like a distributive justice, which is basically who who is bearing the costs of current like environmental damages, no, and, and climate change, and also when when it comes to create policy, well, who's gonna pay uh, like the the mitigation, uh, uh, like a policy climate change mitigation or greenhouse gases reduction, no? Uh, another one is more like the procedural justice, which is basically like who is in the table, no, taking the decisions, whose whose voice is heard. And the, the like a third uh, like a type of, of justice is the like the recognition justice, no? In which like uh, it's basically like recognizing that we are a diverse group of humans in in this world, and that we are all like we we all have like different worldviews, no? So in in the in the side of why it is important, um, I was thinking about like. Uh, uh, like a cool analogy or something that really helps me to um, kind of like to that to to imagine in what point of, of, of history we are now. So if you imagine like uh, if we were like a couple of decades ago, maybe the like the essential toolkit that we would be discussing in a panel of climate change would be, well, guys, this is a human made climate change. Uh, all the evidence is here, and we might be discussing why it's so important to recognize that climate change is caused by industries and by fossil fuels. And like our cool toolkit that we would bring to these type of seminars would be, well, we understand the earth science. We understand the atmosphere now. We have now the knowledge to, like, to identify what, uh, to what extent warming is for climate variability and to what extent is caused by greenhouse gases that we are emitting, no? But now, now that is widely recognized that we are in a problem that it's caused by fossil fuels and by big industries. And now the toolkit that we're talking right now is a different type of toolkit. It's not a science type of, of toolkit. It's more like a, a, a social no, which is like this, the toolkit of environmental justice. And with this toolkit, we, we are getting some like new metrics, new, new lenses and um, new ways to measure uh, climate mitigation and adaptation policies. Mm, it doesn't matter, uh, like, I mean, we, we all agree right now that uh, it's, it's important to diminish the molecules of CO2 that we are emitting, but now it matters where who is gonna pay for those uh, for those mitigation? Who's who needs to like uh, who needs more like adaptation plans? And and we are like more more like uh, we're enriching no this this toolkit with this with this social side um, uh, concept no which is environmental justice. So so yeah I I would say it's um it's a really important uh, uh, concept that we all develop in in our. In our research and, and for example in planeteando what we do here is um also really important to communicate it because then it otherwise it gets isolated within different disciplines so something really cool that actually we did last year or two years ago was like a, we did a climate justice uh video series with uc davis undergrad students that it was like super fun and each of them like researched like their own type of um let's say cases case studies no to identify uh what is climate justice? So it goes from communication all, all the way through academy and to decision making. Well, well, thank you very much for your response. I, I really like the part of, on which you you tell um, that the toolkits have changed from ten years ago to now. I definitely agree with that. But it sounds like environmental justice. It's uh, very. Um, broad term that encompasses many areas and disciplines. Um, you guys also mentioned how like um, environmental injustices affect um, communities differently. What are some ways that we can give voice to marginalized affected by environmental issues or will face the burden of climate change? Yes, uh, well, I think it's important first to 
understand it not as a matter of give, giving them voice because they already have one. And uh, the problem is that we, other people haven't heard it, right? So how can we hear uh, those voices? And some of the, the things that Bernie highlighted uh, before about the, the ways in which environmental justice can be had, for example, uh, procedural or uh, participatory justice, right? So who is in the table? Who, who are you inviting to these talks and who are you inviting to conversations about environmental decision-making is very important. But uh, something that we think as well is that that, that that can be the first step and it's very good, but also we need to start to question what are the structures that are still upholding the logics behind climate and environmental injustices. So it doesn't matter if you have uh, like more CEOs or uh, decision-making boards that are where marginalized groups are part of, the, the same structures that, are, that make society unequal are gonna replicate those inequalities and those injustices. So uh, we say that we need to start uh, uh, dismantling and questioning uh, why the structures that we work right now and that make make that some people have benefits and other have impacts uh, how can we change that ourselves right because the voices are there and they are loud but the problem is that they are they are being punished or uh, silenced on purpose and so we need to realize why well Thank you. That that is a very interesting point. Then Do, doesn't matter like if we have equal representation. If the structures just build for you know mar marginalized communities' voices not to be heard in a sense, if even though they have a voice, maybe it's not being as listened. Um, so we can see that um, giving an equal voice to look every stakeholder. Um, it's something very important. Also, another thing to consider is, um, you know, sh sharing our knowledge. I, th I think also sharing our knowledge can be a powerful tool that can be used to share our values and skills to help in help people in need to address environmental problems. And now I will turn uh, turn the mic to Nadia. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Brittany and Marza. Next, I'll be speaking with Jonathan and Ruby from Engineers Lab Board at UC Davis. Both Jonathan and Ruby work on products with groups of other engineering students to directly positively impact their partner communities. Jonathan is a part of the Peru project, which aims to provide marginalized communities in Peru with, with access to clean and reliable water. And Ruby is a part of the Bolivia project and works to improve sanitation in an impoverished community in Bolivia by building the trains. Ruby, could you tell us a little bit about the mission of Engineers at Borders and about the current projects that you're working on? Yeah, totally. Um, so Engineers at Borders is, is all about building a better world um, through engineering projects that empower communities to meet their basic human needs and equip the future leaders of this world to solve the world's most pressing issues. Um, there are chapters of Engineers Without Borders all over the US and all over the world. Um, so there's one chapter here at UC Davis um, and it's student run, um, but there are also professional chapters of Engineers Without Borders. Um, so at our chapter, we have three um, communities that we're working with in different countries. So we have a project in Kenya, one in Peru and one in Bolivia. Um, so the Kenya project is, uh, they're designing a solar powered borehole well, which will provide water access to a community of about 3,500 people. Um, and then the Peru project, which Jonathan is uh, one of the co-leads for, um, they are implementing a water catchment and um, storage system for providing potable water access to a rural community in northern Peru. And then the Bolivia project, um, which I'm the co um, we are designing and implementing composting latrines for every household in a rural community in the Bolivian highlands. So that's like what our project and what our chapter is uh, working on. And um, despite the pandemic and not being able to travel to our communities, we've been able to continue our relationships and continue our um, implementations um, and working with the community. So um, the Bolivia project back in 2020, we were still able to build a latrine 
um, in our community without traveling. We hired people there, we worked with them, we discussed our design, um, we sent over money, and they were able to successfully build a latrine. Um, so things are still happening, even with the pandemic. Um, so that's been pretty cool. Um, yeah, EWB in general, it's, it's great because it teaches student members um, not only engineering design skills, but also communication skills, fundraising and grant writing skills, um, cultural awareness, and I mean, environmental justice as well. So it's, it's a really cool club to be a part of. Um, and not just engineers are on our teams. It's actually really great to have different perspectives, um, not just the engineering focus. So um, we really encourage all members, all students at uh, Davis to consider joining Engineers Without Borders. Um, yeah, we've got some cool projects. Thanks, Ruby. Um, I can definitely attest that Engineers Without Borders is pretty cool. Um, one of the things that I was most excited about to um, get started with at Davis and it's been a great time. Um, Jonathan, how, could you tell us a bit about how your team approached the pre project so that the local community felt involved in the process? Uh, yeah, so I think um, this is one of the main um, aspects of our uh, projects and Engineers Without Borders, um, because one of the um, things that, that we really like to do is from our partnerships is that the community is eventually able to take ownership of the project and be able to um, operate and um, maintain the system during and um, after our initial um, five-year um, partnership. Um, so what we um, in the Peru project did is uh, a couple of things. Um, the first being um, communication. So um, this is related to first, um, setting clear um, communication expectations, right? So um, how often and with, with um, what means we're gonna communicate with each other. And um, also um, like who will be um, communicating with the um, community. So this is done so that the community will, um, sometimes they'll get um, like build trust with um, a particular member. And so over time you, you get that, um, a relationship and then sometimes the community members will um, tell you I guess a bit more um, you know about what's going on in the community um, and then it's just that uh, relationship and that trust is really important um, in our projects um, because it makes them open to um, or feel comfortable like to ask um, questions um, and bring up any um, concerns that, that they may have um, and then the other aspect is um, listening. So we don't just want to pretend like we um, always have the answers, right? So we want to make sure that's more of a discussion. And if they have any things that, that they would like to um, change, for example, in the design um, of the reservoir, like we did in Peru, um, you know, they can um, bring those up to us and then we can work around that. Um, and then the last thing I'd like to mention is uh, being able to improvise. So like the, the two things I mentioned earlier, like communication and listening, those were particularly important in our uh, project because when we um, went to Peru to um, build the water tank, I guess, um, the community they didn't, um, I guess like the shape of the roof that um, we had initially designed. And so being able to listen to their concerns and understand their concerns and not just um, like tell them like, like, you know, this is how we're gonna do it. Um, I, I think it's really important that, um, that that back and forth, that discussion and understanding why um, they are bringing up those concerns. Cause um, at the end of the day, uh, they're gonna be the ones that are um, using um, you know the, the water tank for their um, daily needs. So, yeah. Thanks, Jonathan. And how did listening and sharing your knowledge with the community and collaborating with them throughout the project, as you mentioned, improve the project? Have there been any notable differences from the beginning of the project until now? Um, yeah. So um, again, I think that communication and listening was really important because at first um, it can be. Like, like it was a bit um, hard for the um, community members to you know, trust us. Um, and especially in Peru where um, the engineering 
field is typically um, men. So having our um, our team members here, you know, from various like backgrounds, not even just civil engineering, but you know, different genders, being able to travel to the community, um, it was a bit, it, it was like something new uh, for them um, as well. Um, and so through that um, discussion and that um, whole like process of you know coming up with the design and talking with them, I think it, it like it really built up that trust. And then you know like throughout the like like the project, you know, you could tell that they became more comfortable with um, certain members of, of our um, project, and it just again like that trust is really important um, because it, like if, if they don't feel comfortable telling us something, then um, later on it, like it will come up in the project. So I think one, like one of the um, big differences for us was them feeling comfortable with um, with us, and then being able to share um, like what's going on in the community because um, for some people, it can be a little difficult to, to share those things. So. Thank you, Jonathan and Ruby and your teams for all the amazing work that you've been doing. Um, the communities that your projects partner with are obviously some, some of the communities that will be most affected by the impacts of environmental issues and climate change. And as Santiago and Rise and Bernie were saying, um, a really important part of environmental justice is giving these stakeholders a voice and considering how our actions, even if with positive intentions, can affect these most vulnerable communities. Um, so I'm sure that the audience would love to hear more about in the Q&A segment later, but first I will turn it over to Jerry, who will introduce our next set of speakers. Hey guys, thank you Nadia, Johnston, and Ruby. And now we have Marilyn and Hannah from the United Nations Millennial Fellowship Program here at UC Davis. The Millennial Fellowship Program is a program that empowers students to lead impactful work on the UN Sustainable Development Goals in their communities. And they recently worked to organize an environmental justice conference. Marilyn was one of the class of the 2021 Millennial Fellows here at UC Davis. She's a recent alumna with a Bachelor of Science in Computer Engineering. She's passionate about climate action and plans to pursue graduate studies in energy systems or renewable technologies. Hannah is a current fourth year majoring in environmental policy and human rights at UC Davis. She's passionate about environmental and climate justice and follow these passions to become a 2021 Millennia Fellow. She hopes to continue to work on issues of climate change and environmental justice in the future as an environmental lawyer. So hi, Marilyn and Hannah, could you tell us a little bit more about your work at the Millennial Fellowship and the conference that you guys organize? Hi, Jerry, um, I can go ahead. So the Environmental Justice Conference at UC Davis took this uh, place this past January 8th. And the purpose essentially was to advance the Sustainable Development Goal 11 for sustainable communities and 13 climate action. And essentially it was like a three hour long conference. We had Chancellor May as a speaker and also five expert speaker, speakers as panelists. Um, those included uh, Dr. Amy Arginal from Human Rights, uh, Dr. Mark Cooper from Human Ecology, Dr. Sally Miller from Civil and Environmental Engineering, and Melinda Adams, who was a Native American Studies PhD candidate and Councilman Dan Carson of the City of Davis. So we had quite a variety of different panelists to come talk to us and kind of share um, either the research or the, uh, the field of work that they're doing and how uh, we can work together with the school to kind of um, both bring the conversation more to the front and also see what we can do in terms of action. All right, that sounds great. I wish I've seen that conference later so I could join too as well, but I guess it's too late. So could you guys also give us a little bit more background on what motivated this project? Why do you guys have the idea to hold a conference about environmental justice? And why is environmental justice such an important issue right now? Absolutely. Um, so I was really inspired to work on this project with Marilyn and Andy. Um, 
because uh, I've learned more about environmental justice as a student here at UC Davis. Um, when I first started, there was just a couple of seminars on environmental justice, and now we have um, classes and full curriculum that's coming out teaching students about um, these really important topics. Um, and so I was really excited to see those offerings expand. Um, and I really wanted to be a part of that, um, especially to make this knowledge of these issues more accessible to students who maybe aren't in environmental studies or aren't in STEM fields necessarily. Um, this conference was open to all students. We also had faculty join us, which was really exciting, um, and community members. So it really was just a way to kind of get the word out there to everyone, whether they're a student or not, um, and let them gain insight into what environmental and climate justice is. Um, like Marilyn said, we had uh, a really interdisciplinary panel. And so they each kind of brought in their own approach to environmental justice issues and had their own suggestions for how people could actually uh, work towards environmental justice in their own lives. So um, that, that was something that I think I was really excited about um, and really happy that we were able to make happen as part of this project. Yeah, 100% agree with Hannah. Um, so all three of us, me, Hannah and, Ann, Hannah and Annie, are very concerned about climate change and basically the dis disproportionate effects it'll have worldwide. And climate change is, is also basically a social problem. And fighting against climate change is, in a sense, also fighting against social injustices. Um, so we need to take action through uh, change at the individual policy, institutional, governmental, and corporation levels, all of them. Um, so we wanted to facilitate, facilitate a conversation among the students, staff, and faculty at UC Davis to discuss environmental justice. And there's no better time than now to talk about um, environmental justice as we head into a climate-impacted future. Um, so we must bring justice and equity as well um, as we start to face more and more problems exacerbated by climate change, and such as the displacement of people, due to worsening um, natural disasters, increasing extreme weather, um, and the already existing in inequities that we see um, within uh, the communities of people of color and social economically disadvantaged people as well. I 100% agree with you guys as well. I think it's very important to motivate students or at least raise their public knowledge on what climate change are and environmental justice to let them realize that things are happening around us. So the environmental justice conference sounds like it was a major undertaking and it involved a lot of notable speakers. For our audience here today, could you give us one or two of the most important takeaways that you found interesting or reflective? Yeah, um, so I touched on this a little bit and Marilyn also kind of illustrated the breadth of speakers that we had. Um, one thing that I think was such an important takeaway was just how interdisciplinary environmental justice work is. Um, and so no matter what your own personal interest or background is in, whether you're a very technical person and in engineering, like our engineers without borders have showed us here today as well, um, or if you're more on the social science or policy side, or even communications, um, all of these different avenues are ways that you can work towards environmental justice. Um, and so, you know, it doesn't really matter where you're coming from or what background you have, um, you can really use your skills and what you're interested in um, to fight for these really, really important issues. Um, so I think our panel of expert speakers were really able to showcase that um, as they came from all different um, areas of study um, and even the greater community of Davis. Um, and I think that really illustrated to our audience also that, you know, they have the power to do the same kind of thing, um, no matter what kinds of um, academic or other interests and backgrounds they have. Yeah, 100% agree as well. Um, for me, I think one of the biggest takeaways is that one of the most powerful ways to improve environmental justice is to make your voice heard. And you can do that through voting and being an active member of your local community and your government. So one of our speakers, uh, Dan Carson, uh, council member Dan Carson, he provided us with a lot of uh, resources. I'm gonna put that in the chat. Um, where you can make your voice be heard, uh, especially within the, uh, the city of Davis itself. 
Um, and the city of Davis actually works a lot in conjunction with UC Davis in terms of trying to achieve these climate goals. Um, so these are definitely great resources that are work, uh, worth looking into. And also um, the director of sustainability, uh, Camille Kirk, I believe she's also on this call. Um, she also provided some great links, um, the volunteer links on sustainability goals here at UC Davis and also a huge undertaking project that's going on right now at UC Davis on the campus, which is the big shift to uh, to replace the, the pipes underground. Um, I'm sure if you're on campus, you've been seeing the construction for that around. Um, so yeah, those are some great resources that people can check out. Um, also another takeaway is um, it's just really important to uh, learn as much as you can. And as uh, Hannah said, like educate yourself on the different kinds of work and projects that are going on um, that a lot of researchers and faculty members are um, working on uh, for their research. Um, and they're doing so much amazing work. So it was this, I it feel like this conference is a great opportunity for uh, people to learn about the different types of research that's going on. Um, for example, I'm like an engineering, I was an engineering major, but I also learned so much about um, human rights as well. So yeah, it was really interesting and interdisciplinary. Thank you guys for telling us so much of our project. I'm sure there are a lot of new information and a lot of great things that students can do around the campus. I'm, I've heard about them. <laughs> it sounds fascinating and I would love to, love to learn more. But now we have reached the Q&A portion of our event. So I open it up to the audience to see if we have received any questions for any of our speakers. Oh, so the first question is, it's, it's actually for Reza and Bernie. Um, they say that you guys are amazing people doing great work that are meaningful. And, but they have a question. They ask, how can you overcome the status quo, which feels like there's only talk about environmental justice and not enough action about them? Yes, uh, thank you for this question, which is a really good one. And I think that one of the most uh, impactful things that one can do is uh, highlight to people how uh, environmental justice or climate justice is related to what they care about. Because some the issue with complacency is that uh, for people that are, are not mobilizing right now, it's because it's not impacting impacting them. But maybe they have other things they care about, right? Like a housing crisis or a food crisis. There are a lot of issues that are going on right now that people care about, but maybe they don't see it through this environmental lens. So I think the first step would be to push them to see uh, that all that is interconnected and that maybe they don't need to focus completely on the climate part, but we need to start making these connections and networks and being like, uh, yeah, like I as a climate activist or, or environmental activist, uh, I, I will support you on the issue that you care about, right? So if it's uh, more of a social, like purely social, if you see it as racial justice or uh, gender justice, uh, we need to, to give each other hands to support our fights. And then that way you can also be like, hey, like we need your input into what we're doing with our things. So I think that that, that would be my answer. I don't know if you want to say No, that. yeah, totally yeah. agree. I just wanna like maybe highlight uh, the importance also of um, individual actions as a trigger of collective action, because maybe this has happened to you or, or I don't know, this happened to me, for example, when you start like reading about like, okay, why there's no like change, you know, in, in terms of like environmental uh, justice or climate change mitigation. And you start like uh, realizing about these imposed structures you're like, okay, no, we need to change everything. Like, uh, it doesn't matter if I drive from point A to point B, like those emissions are nothing compared to the industries, which is true, but that type of, um, let's say, yeah, kind of like individual complacency, like it's been widely demonstrated that even if like these individual actions uh, contribute very little to mitigating emissions like the in the physical aspect, no? they contribute a lot or are they triggering for collective changes? So I just wanna highlight that in the sense that we need individual actions because it's what, it's, it's the fuel no? of, of, like a, of, the collective, of the collective change. So maybe I would, I would um, 
add that as well. So you guys put the answer. I'm sure it's a time taking process and, and definitely take a lot of process. And the next question is for every for everyone, but I think that Reza and Bernie already answered kind of answered that. So I'm gonna open it up to the rest of the panelists. The question is, in your opinion, what is something that we could do in our daily lives to promote environmental justice in the community and raise public public awareness or um, teach people public knowledge about this topic? Does anyone want to go first? Um, I can I can try at this one. So this is my own personal opinion. Uh, this wasn't derived directly from the conference that we had, but I believe that using your wallet to make your voice heard is very important because unfortunately within the society we are in right now, money is kind of what drives everything. So if you are being conscious of where you're spending your money and where you're investing that money, um, it really makes a difference because unfortunately a lot of companies are really tied up with um, like the fossil fuel companies and you want to be mindful of um, what kind of uh, corporations or what kinds of uh, companies that you're buying from and if they have you know commitment to sustainability if they're actually uh, making those promises and keeping those promises not just greenwashing the public so I believe that um, just being aware and uh, vote, voting with your wallet is very important in that aspect. Uh, I would also add, kind of just to reiterate uh, what Marilyn said earlier, also voting in the traditional sense if you're able to. Um, and, you know, it sometimes is hard to research all the different things that are coming out on different ballots. Um, but especially on um, like a local level, like Marilyn had dropped some links to things going on in Davis in, here in California. Um, there is often um, like environmental initiatives and things that, you know, do seem like they are on a small scale, but if there's enough action um, in the community, you know, that can always spill over into greater and greater geographical areas. Um, so really just trying to take uh, a little bit more time and going through those if you're able to and um, really voting for the ones that you think really speak to your values, especially as they relate to environmental justice. All right, thank you guys for the answer. I understand that you have to run, Hannah, but thank you for joining us. I'll see you next time, I guess. So the third question is also for everyone. Um, this as, is asking about how do you think activism around climate justice can overcome and reconcile? The barriers put up by industry that both profit from the status quo and also need to invest largely to decarbonize. For example, converting natural gas to H2. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. I think it's an AT gas to H2. Anyone has their own perspective on that? I think this might be a quick question for Ryzen and Bernie, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I was trying to mute. Yeah, so actually that's a, that's a very, um, that's a very good question. And actually it's kind of related with also the, the other question in the, in the Q&A panel, which is, um, yeah, I think we need to, to, to take action in the, in the streets, no? And we need to like um, make it clear that it's not a matter of options. I mean, recently, I mean, it's a matter of options, but, but not, not priori prioritizing the ones that have always taken the options or that have historically um like damaged climate no so so recently i have seen a lot of like um symposiums in academia for example that talk about transition risk so transition risk is defined by banks by national banks and private sector uh, regarding what are the costs for them to comply with climate policy and they like map out 
what is gonna cost them to reduce emissions and what are the implications for like the economy and the welfare. And it's kind of scary that you actually like uh, are saying that doing climate policy is a risk and it's a transition risk that banks now are like uh, kind of trying to avoid. So it's, I don't know, like uh, it, it makes me think about that. And also um, regarding like, uh, yeah, I think that we need to, to take action in the streets. And I, I like how like um, an earth scientist, a geoscientist like put it uh, like uh, also like a decade ago in terms of what we are seeing is like a machine in itself going forward, which is like this machine that it, it's, it accumulates uh, territory, water, energy, it uh, like uh, pollutes, like uh, it, it emits greenhouse gases. And the only way to stop this machine is to step out of it and like throw it at it rocks and like uh, burn it and put something like there's only there's the only way to really like uh, uh, trying to stop this machine of like environmental destruction that we are. So um, on March 25th, actually, there's like this global strike for climate change. So I think we should also like meet in the streets as well. No, I mean we're going to be at least 39 persons there. So that's going to be, that's going to be super cool. Thank you, Bernie. So um, I actually have a next question following up, but um, I think Bernie always answered beforehand. So I'm going to give it to the rest of the panelists. Um, the question says that University of California is famous for progressive thinking and action, but it, is, it has required action in the streets. Individual action is not going to be enough. And do you feel like there's responsibility to organize and make more noise? Can you start to shut down the system that are the problems? I'm gonna give you guys a little time to think about that. <laughs> um, I would say if possible, uh, join like climate protests, uh, local ones or ones that are uh, um, for the state. I know that since Davis is so close to Sacramento, it's very convenient to, you know, go to the Capitol and hopefully join a uh, climate protest. Or if you if you're able to uh, like form your own as well, that'd be really cool. Because really, I feel that all these big movements are are stem from grass move, grassroots movements. So. Uh, grassroots uh, people in power. So um, I know it's it's like weird for me to go like, yeah, just start a protest. But, you know, um, we individuals, yes, it's true. I agree that like at the individual level, we cannot overcome the amount of emissions um, that are being produced by uh, like corporations and governments as well. But um, as we mentioned before, voting is important, protesting is important. Um, it does stem from an individual, it can stem from an individual who can, um, you know, bring up the, the, the will for other individuals to work together as a group. So it starts from an individual, but I do believe that it should end with like collective uh, efforts as well. So I, I know that this, I don't know if this answer is satisfying because I, I also have the same questions as well. Like, trust me, like I, I also feel a lot of times like, you know, what, what if, or not what if, but I know that me alone cannot, you know, fight climate change. And it's true, not one person can, but I believe that using collective power, it is possible. We can try to do something. Sure, thank you, Marilyn. Um, the next question is gonna be for the engineers with, without borders. Can you guys tell me what's a common concept misconception about environmental justice and community justice? I think it's mainly talking about your projects as well. Um, sure, I'm a little confused. Um, environmental justice versus community justice? Climate in regards justice, to our community? I think. Oh, climate justice. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah it's just in your that. communities. Um, yeah. Um, I think our projects kind of work with both. Um, there is that like engineering aspect um, often because we're focusing on um, providing water or providing sanitation. Um, but there really is that social aspect as well. 
And at the same time in our designs, we have to consider how climate will affect these communities, climate change will affect these communities in the future. I know for the Bolivia project, we've done a little bit of research on how the climate is predicted to change over the next um, 30 years um, and taking that into account because our toilets use water to flush um, the waste. And so we have to make sure that they have um, access to enough water year round um, with the changing um, rainfall patterns there. Um, so that was incorporating a little bit of climate action, I guess. Um, but also, let's see, I don't know. Jonathan, do you want to add on a little bit, maybe about environmental justice as well? Um, yeah, so um, I think more specifically with uh, the, the Peru project and the, the Peru team, um, I think something that, the, um, that, something that we've seen is that sometimes um, the community like leaders, they don't have like the tools and the means to help the communities that they are supposed to. Um, so like even though the, um, like, like the communities, you know, they, like in our case, they, like they lack access to, um, to drinking water. Um, I think the people that are supposed to help them don't, don't have that background to, to help them. So then it's like, that's like a whole, like another level of like miscommunication that, that happens there um, because it affects them now and, and like it'll affect them like as long as that person is in that position. Um, and it, it will, like, like it's not like, like n n nothing much can be um, done unless they seek um, outside help, like I guess with um, either you be. That's great answers. So what's the next thing about what's something that unexpected that happened in the project and what you guys or what you, what's unexpected that you guys learn from the projects? So um, something that we've un oh go ahead. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> something unexpected that we've learned from the projects. Sorry, I think maybe my Wi-Fi is is bad. Jonathan, how about you go? Uh, um, so I guess something unexpected for us is like that sometimes the community does things um, before they talk to us or before they um, um, tell us and that affects our like our design right so if they um, for example like put in um, water meters in like the, the water usage households and you know we're not aware of that um, then it's it, it, it can change our, you know, our design. And I think sometimes the, I think that's where the communication component comes in. And, and also um, some, like something that surprises us is that, um, again, just like the people that are, um, you know, in the positions um, in the municipality to, to help them um, sometimes don't, or like our, um, it's not that they're not able to, is that they just don't. Um, and I think that the reasons are um, like really surprising to us because um, they get, I guess, paid um, to do so. But, yeah, I guess I'll pass it over to, to Ruby. Yeah, that, that is more touching on like environmental justice, I guess, as we've realized sometimes in our communities, there's these people in power that have the ability to share the resources that they have access to and they don't. And so it's sometimes we have to realize we have to be able to communicate with them and come like res resolve some of these conflicts with between community members because there's this like power dynamic where some have access to say water or sanitation resources or building materials and some don't. Um, and we can't go in and expect everyone to have the resources or be able to evenly provide resources automatically. So it takes a little bit of working and communication to get there. Thank you, Ruby and Jonathan. I'm sure those are stories that we can learn from and pro progress ourselves from. So the last question is gonna be also for everyone. 
I'm sure that we have reached the time. And the question is, are there any environmental justice issues that are commonly overlooked from you guys' opinion? All right, Jerry, could you repeat the question? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, is there any environmental justice questions or issues that are commonly overlooked from you guys' opinion? No, yeah, honestly, that's a, that's a great question. Like, because it's, I think like uh, those are the, the ones that matter the most, no? And like, maybe we don't even know like uh, what are those, no? But I can think now in, two, uh, in Mexico, like, um, I don't know, today I was like reading about them and are like, uh, both are related to tourism, no? And like um, the way in which you frame things uh, and like um, these mega infrastructures that, that, uh, that what you're, you're assuming that they're gonna like bring economic inputs or economic benefits and then flow throughout society. And I think, uh, yeah, I don't know, like a, a lot of a lot of uh, tourism that is not like led or, or like um, yeah managed by the local communities like does a lot of, like does a, a lot of harm uh, many times. Um, one that comes to mind for me is always um, air pollution. Um, I had a class on air pollution last quarter, and we were talking about how it's not a separate SDG. Out of the 17 SDGs, air pollution isn't. There's water, uh, clean water and um, sanitation, and then there's um, climate action, but there isn't really a focus as much directly on air pollution. Um, and that's something, air pollution, both like air pollution and indoor air pollution is something that um, kills people prematurely, like millions of people every year. So. Um, that's an interesting one. Engineers Thought Borders doesn't really focus at all on that type of um, environmental issue. We focus on water and sanitation, but um, it is another um, issue within the environment that I wish we would address more. All right, I guess that's all. Thank you everyone for the response. I'm sure I, I myself had learned a lot from the Q&A sections and I'm sure the audience is as well. So for next one, I'm gonna give it to Santiago for the closing words of our conference this time. Well, um, thank you panelists again. And well, I guess we can take from this um, that no individual action is too little you know, individual actions do matter and they, they incentivize change. So I would like to thank everyone here for coming today, our panelists and our audience. Please feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to be connected and collaborate with, with you guys with, if you guys have any questions. I would also like to, um, we will also like to um, thank our supervisors, Joelene Shoemaker and Tom Rosen Molina for helping us set up this environmental justice and climate just, justice symposium. They, they are our supervisors and they have been great and very helpful for us. And thank you all for coming and sharing this experience with us. I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks for having us.